Tom here from Lawrence Systems. Unify has made some big changes in 2025 with the release of Unify Network Application version 9. But before we talk about those changes, I want to point out that this video is not sponsored by Unify, but if you'd like to hire us for consulting or buy some swag like the shirt I'm wearing, you can do so over at lawrencesystems.com. I want to start out by saying that I've been using Unify since before I was making YouTube videos. This is a Unify AP I bought back around 2014 for a client project that we pulled out to put in some new gear because they wanted something faster, not because it failed. Their reputation was built on Wi-Fi and later some of their switching, but their firewalls have taken a very long time to catch up in features. But before I get to the firewall features, I do want to talk about what makes Unify popular at their core. And that's this edge first philosophy or business speak for saying, hey, we let you host things and we don't force you to sign up for our cloud. They have, as they put it, minimal cloud dependencies. What that means is if I want to set up a firewall or many of the other devices, I can do so without using a login with their cloud. You can do local setup. This is something that most any company, software companies, hardware companies, they all want you locked into their cloud, locked into their ecosystem and even Microsoft Windows has made that harder and harder with each iteration to try to set up local accounts. They want to make this hard. They want you tied to their services. And this is something that Unify has really done a great job and makes them a differentiator in the market of offering something with a local login. Almost unheard of. But this is where I say minimal cloud dependencies because they do have a central dashboard. If you are in the IT services or managed service provider space and you manage lots of sites, having a dashboard is actually really nice. Now that dashboard is reaching out to and grabbing data and consolidating in that dashboard. So it is an option, as I said, but not a requirement. So if you're a home user that says, I don't want to use any of the cloud things, well, the one thing you will lose, and this has been complained about before, is it doesn't have a way to get notifications to you, but they offer webhooks and there's there's ways around that. So you can use your own email server and your own webhooks to do it. So that is a cloud dependency is why they call it minimal. The notification system generally goes through there. So it's actually really nice if you've ever had to set up webhooks. It's not something that's hard to do, but it is an extra step or just use their cloud because you still have local control over your system and you can still log in locally even when you have it attached to your cloud. I will mention really quickly here, they do have a very mature bug bounty program. It's been around since 2014 and I have had friends use this and I have had friends paid out doing this. So if you know some bugs, go ahead and report on Ubiquity if you know of some type of flaw with their system. Their security team very on top of things if you find flaws. Now, the first feature isn't exactly one that was released in 2025, but it's certainly one that has matured a lot in 2025 with the Dream Machine line or any of the systems that have the built-in controller. And that's the ability to do high availability or as they call it, shadow mode. This has worked fine, but it's the updates that matter. The updates have also gone well. All my version 9 updates all the way to 9.5 where we're at today, and of course then the Unify OS, the operating system itself updates, have gone flawlessly. That's important because that is, well, let's just say challenging on some firewalls when you put them in a high availability mode, there's often extra instructions on how to update them in high availability mode. This is not the case with Unify. It's extremely automated when you update the main system. If that system reboots, it'll flip right over to the shadow gateway. Then the shadow gateway, when it sees the main one come back, it'll go back over to it and your update's done and then it'll automatically update the shadow gateway. So there's not anything you have to do. One of the big changes here in 2025 is the support has now been official for the Unify Enterprise Gateways. This is something that was released in 2025. So the Unify Enterprise Gateways are the ones where you host the controller. They'll support shadow mode now as well. There's something we're using over at my friend Mike's site. Uh, he runs a company called Railstream. I've talked about on a channel before, but they move about uh, six to 700 terabytes, maybe a little bit more per month with a pair of UXG enterprise systems. And they've worked quite well recently with the shadow mode updates. Now they're ready to take over and uh, it's a pretty cool feature. Now, the first big change was zone based firewalls, which came at the beginning of the year with version nine. This allows you to create networks and then put those networks in zones. The zones have different rules applied. So this particular zone called internal or this zone called NSW nets has a set of rules. And then every network we put within that zone inherits that rule set. And it's easy to move things to different zones. I hit save and they would move from up here to down here in this zone. I've got a whole video breaking down how that works. Also, they made the rules a lot easier to read with their most recent change, which is their policy table. And the default view of seeing all the policies is a bit overwhelming. So we turn off the default policies and then we narrow it down to what are we looking for? Do I only want to see the firewall rules? 
Well, I can filter to just those. What about just the DNS records? Well, I can see that right here as well. Or if I wanna see the QoS rules, I really like the way they've done this because they take something that initially can be a little bit overwhelming by having everything in view and well, can view too much here down to a much more narrow view of only what you want. And when you wanna create a new policy, you have the options here to create whichever policy type you want. Instead of going through different menus, I can create a DNS entry, a firewall rule, a route, etc., all right here. I've also got a dedicated video just for DNS. You'll find linked down below. All of these are searchable. So if you want to find a specific DNS record or maybe a specific firewall rule that you created, you can filter for any of these to be able to click on them and edit them. So you have that default view, the narrow down view or a search view because you named it a certain thing and you want to be able to narrow it to that. And we have their new object manager. And the object manager allows you to create an object such as a group of clients or even a network. Let's say we want to take everything from the 1337 lab. We'll just call this test. And we want to apply a route to all the traffic or we want to apply QoS and a route to all the traffic. And we want to push it out one specific interface like the PIA Switzerland interface or maybe this Proton Switzerland interface that I have. I've got videos on each of these, how to use the policy manager and how to use the object manager to create routes. But this is an easy way to create groupings of any of the devices or networks or even an individual device and apply certain policies to it. Now, these policies also show up back in the policy manager or as you've seen here, Here's all the ones that I've previously created, such as I use a tool called Chasm, and I'd like it to go out to this particular VPN in Chicago with a kill switch. You're just a couple of clicks away from setting that up. Now there's been a lot of changes to the way the system shows the client devices. We can filter this much better. We can say, I wanna see offline devices that have only been offline during this period and filter right to them, or clear these filters and show online devices but only the wired ones. I don't need to see the wireless devices. And then I can click on each of these devices. They still have the option to change the icon if it doesn't identify it. Some devices, like the TrueNAS boxes, it seems to identify with the right icons, and it will let you know exactly what port it's connected to. But where this goes a step further is the DHCP system. This was always a little bit, well, not mature. It has really been enhanced quite a bit here in 2025, which now includes the ability to import or export. And I really like this feature because if you're migrating from another firewall, you can import all of your DHCP reservations or export them back out if you want to migrate away and get the data back out. This is really handy. I think this feature is actually something I wish they had a long time ago, but hey, they have it now. I'm happy to see it in here. Now let's talk about port management. There's been a lot of change here, especially the recent AI anomaly score feature. So you can filter for any of the ports that are having trouble. I think this is a nice feature, but what I really like is just being able to click on the SFPs here, filter for all the ones in use, be able to see those details. You can see the different SFP modules I have. You can even see when the SFP module reports it, what voltage and current it's using, and be able to make modifications directly to that port or see statistics. Now, all of the ports I have are in excellent condition, so none of them have an error on them, but this is where that anomaly detection will filter for only ports that have different errors. And the errors it's checking for is traffic path, broadcast discovery, network loops and storm control, or cable and power connections. So you can, at a glance, quickly see and then drill down to any port that's having a problem. Also, you can invert these and say, show me anything that is not connected. It'll also let you filter for critical or warning. So if any of the ports are having problems, you can filter them still by this as opposed to using the scoring system that they have. And the score is an aggregated score for how bad any of the conditions are of the things it tracks. And this doesn't just apply to SFPs. If we click on main, we can do the same thing with any of the ports or any specific switch, which once again, this is another interface that's been enhanced quite a bit. So we have more statistics and easy ways to click on any switch, see exactly what it's connected to, what the native VLAN is, and change any of the settings on it. There's also the ability to select multiple ports and apply group changes to them to set them to such as another VLAN or disable any of those group supports. Now a related feature that was added in 9.5 is a default security posture for ports. It does still default to allow all, but you have the ability to do block all. 
New VLANs and Ethernet port profiles and devices will be isolated by default while existing ones remain unchanged. So as you create a new VLAN, it will block that by default on all the ports. Right now, it's going to allow it on all the ports, and this may not be the posture you want. So I like that they've added this as an option. I get leaving it to allow all because that's the least amount of support calls that you will get because if everything's blocked and you have to enable it on every individual port, some people may not know to do that. But if you are looking for a better security posture so it's blocked and you have to enable it on a port when you add a new network, well, that's an option now that they have. Now, as I said earlier, Wi-Fi is what they're known for. It's always been good, but it keeps getting better. AP deployment density might need improvement. This is because I keep wandering beyond the range of my outdoor Wi-Fi, so it's suggesting that I should probably add more. That might not be a bad idea. But we can look at here at the access points. We can look at the clients. It'll give us a lot more statistics. I have it filtered down to just my phone, so I can look at how my phone's connected and track those details. This is actually something interesting that they've added to the logs as well. The ability to follow or track any of the devices on your network, what they're connecting to when they roam. Not only that, you can go a step further in their alarm manager and build alarms to notify you of very specific events. For example, my wife was having trouble with her work laptop. Kind of an odd problem. It was disconnecting. So I set it up to let me know when it was connecting or disconnecting. And I had it track as it roamed. So it'll send me any reminders via notify. Or as I mentioned, if you were don't want to use the Unify Cloud, you can do this all via webhook and have it notify you or create some type of action in Home Assistant, for example. This is really nice because I can watch what happens following the Wi-Fi, following the connections, look through all the logs. I'm doing it all within the Unify interface to try to figure out why there might have been a problem with it. Which brings me to some Wi-Fi planning enhancements that came out in 9.5 as well. You have the ability for each one of the channels, 2.4, 5, or 6, to click on Optimize, It'll go through, scan these, and choose different channels that ask you if you would like to apply. So this isn't going to do anything other than do some channel planning, see if there's any overlap. I can already tell you there's not. And then have an option to apply those settings. Also has the ability to click on any of these to block out certain channels if I know I don't want to use them, apply those changes, and make those channels unavailable. And if you've goofed this up too much, they do have a reset to defaults here. Now, another thing that's been updated quite a bit is the ability to monitor traffic flows to be able to see where things are going, how many packets they send there, and the different applications that they might be using. They've had this in Unify for a while, but it's been enhanced quite a bit. And back to the traffic flows, they also give you very good details that they didn't give before for what IP addresses, what the packets received are, the flow ID, et cetera, and the quick ability here to block the connection, block a destination IP, or block that source IP. So it gives you fast ways to pivots or even click on the client to then go look at insights from that client about what it's doing, what it's connected to. I really like that they've brought this together so as from an experience standpoint, I can go between any of these without having to jump to a lot of different menus. Now, Unify's had content filtering for a long time, but they've now introduced CyberSecure Enhanced by Proofpoint and Cloudflare content filtering. What they're doing is allowing you to activate a subscription. I know that Unify is the no subscriptions to them, but this is a subscription essentially to the Proofpoint and Cloudflare list that's an enhanced list. It's not required that you need this for Unify, but if you want the more advanced content filtering features and you want all of these lists and categories, well, that is a paid feature that they're buying a subscription and are letting you know it's from Proofpoint and Cloudflare to give a better list than basic content filtering. You're still able to do standard content blocking and put in sites you want to block, but if you'd like that to be more automated and you'd like to just check a box to group all of these categories together, that's where the enhanced cybersecure package comes in. I've got a dedicated video I'll leave linked down below on the topic. So that sums up where we're at as far as major changes from 9 to 9.5 here in 2025. And it really is software catching up with hardware. There's always been a lot of, well, people in the forums that did a lot of hacking away to add features to these that wasn't supported through the Unify software, but we figured out because it's Linux on the back end how to add these features. So the hardware has been capable for quite a while, but the software just didn't enable some of the things people wanted. But here we are today, things like WireGuard VPN, OpenVPN, and a lot of other features, as I mentioned, just integrate well and all work through the interface. Now, I also am holding right here, just been a lot of hardware releases, a UCG fiber, which I think is a really good value. This will route at a 
about five gigs with traffic inspection turned on. And uh, for sub $300, and all the features it supports, as I mentioned, and more, because you can add some of the other Unify ecosystem attached to it. I think this is a pretty good value, as a lot of the other systems are. They're reasonably priced for the price performance that you might want to get out of something, including the faster ones and the high availability mode and being able to do that at a license-free, reasonable price point with their hardware. Now, I didn't cover the Site Manager. The Site Manager is really neat. I'll be covering it in a future video. There's a lot more features coming with the Site Manager because that's the idea that you are an IT or a managed service provider and you have many sites, or maybe you're just a home user and you have to manage several of your family members' routers. You can put them all in one Site Manager. It's logging into a Site Manager, then going down and going to the local interface on all these so you can not have to open up any VPNs or open up these to the, the public internet. It handles all of that for you. It also then gives you the ability to do really cool SD-WAN features like build VPNs between all of them, even if some of them are behind CGNAT. As long as one of them has a public IP, it can control having them talk to the other devices and manage that VPN automatically for you. You can still do these things manually without Site Manager. It's not a requirement. It's just a way to make it really easy. So I'll cover that in a future video. Now, as far as people who want to split hairs on Unify's not enterprise or not this or should only be used in homes or whatever that person is leaving the comment down below that seems to happen all the time, I will mention it comes down to product market fit and use case. Is this a solution for everything? Of course not. Nothing really is. There's a reason we have some of the other devices and you look at the solution you need, figure out whether or not this has the features that fit that, and then you deploy it or you don't because it doesn't have a feature you need. It's really as simple as that. I will completely say the reliability of this, the access points and the switches has been really good. It was always to me and what took me a long time to decide to like the Unify firewalls is they didn't have good software, as I said, until version nine. So that's why I've looked at them a lot more as a solution. As I mentioned, I've deployed these at clients and talked to a lot of people that are using these in larger production environments, and it's been going really well. And you know, that's where Unify is today. It certainly isn't where they were before. It's where they are today, which is why I'm making this video. But love hearing from you. Leave your thoughts and comments down below. Love, uh, you know, the debate, the people who love or hate Unify, whichever team you're on, let me know. And uh, hit me up in the forums for a more in-depth discussion on this or other topics. Thanks. Thanks.